Good evening and welcome to this ORF book, book discussion. Uh, we are joined by Professor Amrita Narlikar and her book, Poverty Narratives and Power Paradoxes in International Trade Negotiations and Beyond is the subject of our conversation this evening. We are joined by Professor Stacey Godard and Professor Pauli, who are going to be engaging with some of the key um, hypotheses that this book seeks to put before us. Uh, before I do that, uh, let me first invite Professor Nardikul to share with us uh, what drove her to put this together. Uh, what are the ideas she wants us to engage with as we negotiate this world in the third decade of the 21st century? And how is it relevant to some of the contemporary questions that we seek to engage with? Uh, Professor Nardikul, I, I, I flipped through your book. I didn't read every page, but I did read quite a few. And I was struck by three ideas that your book uh, propagates. Uh, the first, of course, is uh, the power of the powerless. In some sense, uh, we keep talking about the poverty narratives, but they are quite powerful in terms of creating certain end goals. And I think that's something that you have stressed on, that how countries and communities could coalesce to build a, a powerful force and something that India is no stranger to, we have from the Bandung days, uh, from the non-aligned movement days, to pretty much in the, the current age, we have used that to some degree of success. Uh, you have also mentioned in this book uh, around, uh, you have in fact hinted um, quite um, emphatically that there is a chance to overuse these narratives and perhaps undermine the, the objectives that you had set out to achieve. And finally, you have also spoken about the capture of these narratives by other actors. And uh, many a times, the narratives are thrown back at you, uh, thrown back at the powerless uh, to perhaps prevent them from achieving what they sort of. So uh, you have explored this uh, subject in detail. And we would like to know from you what made you do this? And how do you think we should be engaging with the subject in the days ahead? Over to you, Professor. OK, um, thank you very much, Samir. Um, it is always a pleasure to work with you and ORF. And today, both the honor and pleasure are doubled, at least, to have you chairing the event and to do this together with our distinguished discussants, Lou and Stacey. And I'm, and I'm also looking forward very much to the, to the panel discussion and the exchange with our esteemed audience. So hello to everyone from Germany. So let me just start off by saying a little bit of what is this book about? So just what is the map of the book? So in the book, I study a paradox. And I argue that powerlessness has emerged as a political tool in international negotiation. And I argue that effective and persuasive narratives about poverty are bringing about a fundamental transformation of powerlessness itself into a source of power. And in, this, and in the book, I focus specifically on behaviors and outcomes in a particularly polarizing area of bargaining, international trade. But then I also try to illustrate wider applications of the argument in other settings. The empirical examples reveal some inspiring examples of um, agency and empowerment for the hitherto marginalized, for the excluded. But the wide-ranging and highly effective use of arguments of poverty and powerlessness by the genuinely poor and the weak constitutes only one aspect of the story. So when I started out with this book, I, I really wanted to learn more about agency for the weak and the conditions of highly asymmetric bargaining. What can you do? Um, and that was the starting point. And that's where one gets these heartening stories. But then the more I delved into the subject, I saw that what you already touched upon, Samir, I saw examples of overuse of this poverty narrative and also misuse. So. I show in the book how the use of poverty narratives has emerged as a winning strategy. But I also argue that repeated misapplication risks blunting this weapon. 
and then um, I tried to apply the argument to some other areas. And one of the contributions that this book then tries to make is on the life cycles of narratives. How narratives emerge? How do you build winning narratives? How do narratives change in the hands of different actors? And how do they dissipate? How do they die? And so maybe I'll just give you the argument in brief now. So different narratives can coexist at any one point in time. For example, two broad narratives about poverty had wrestled with each other since the post-World War II era. One narrative understood poverty primarily as a domestic issue. Mm -hmm. And the solution then was the welfare state and other domestic policies as a response. And that was the compromise of embedded liberalism that we saw coming out of the Bretton Woods negotiations. But there was another narrative. And that other narrative explained poverty at least as much as a product of external factors as domestic ones. And therefore, this narrative demanded different forms of redress, ranging from special and differential treatment to a fundamental change in rules of international trade. The first narrative had dominated policy debates for almost half a century after the post-war system was established. And it had support, roughly speaking, from the global north. Developing countries had tried to change this. They advanced alternative epistemic theories, for example, dependency theory. They tried to build alternative institutions, for example, the UNCTAD. They proposed alternative visions of order, for example, the new international economic order. But all these efforts produced only limited successes. And then come the 1980s and early 90s, and this narrative advanced by the Global South was looking more defensive than ever. And then, and then, around the turn of the millennium, something began to change. So recall Jubilee 2000. Recall the launch of the Millennium Development Goals. Recall the Make Poverty History campaign. And this second narrative started to emerge as a winning narrative. Concerns about global poverty reduction became a part of the global scenery as never before. So the old narrative had been about domestic poverty reduction. And now, poverty reduction became a global issue. And in the international trade regime, this was reflected in many significant and interesting ways. And that's what I trace in detail in the book. For example, the collapse of the Seattle Ministerial was a sign of things to come. And then came the launch of the Doha Development Agenda in an organization, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, that had almost taken a great pride in saying, we don't talk about development. Yeah, we're a trade organization. If you want to talk about development, you go to the World Bank, right? It was this really superior attitude to concerns that developing countries had been uh, expressing for decades in the GATT. And now, 2001, we have the launch of the DDA, and development is placed at the core, at the heart of the WTO. Now, these changes did not fall from the heavens. They were mainly a result of four four strategies that developing countries employed. So developing countries backing the narrative, the second narrative, which made global poverty an issue, they discovered new, what negotiation analysts call BATNA, best alternative to negotiated agreement, right? It means that they had alternatives um, that they could turn to, and the rise of the BRICS certainly helped. So this was also a little bit about the power shift and being able to exploit that. Second, they used new tactics to reframe the issues that they, were, they had been trying to raise for a long time. The coalitions that they used to negotiate also changed. 
And finally, transnational social movements. Developing countries have been very re reluctant uh, previously to engage with civil society actors on shared causes. And come the turn of that millennium, we get a much greater willingness for the Global South to work with civil society actors within the Global South and also the Global North. So what I've given you so far is, is a heartening story of empowerment. But then comes the twist in the tale. Because it's not only the poor themselves who have learned to use the poverty narrative. Rich countries have done this as well. And an example of this is the Trump administration. This is not the first time that a US administration is taking protectionist measures in the name of the poor, nor will it be the last, I suspect. But the current US administration has indeed harnessed the prevalent domestic discontent very effectively, and even fanned it further by building a narrative that links domestic inequalities and poverty within the US to global trade governance. And that is the problem with not just the trade debate or the poverty narrative. It's the problem with many successful narratives. And the problem is this. They tend to work like asset bubbles. As an increasingly large number and diversity of actors become aware of their users, the temptation to overuse and misuse these narratives also increases. And the bursting of the bubble generates costs for the system as a whole. In the case of the poverty and powerlessness narratives, these costs will likely be the greatest for the most vulnerable members of society, many of whom stood to benefit the most from that original poverty narrative. So, so let, me, let me ask you a question here before I turn to Professor Godard and uh, just Pauline. Uh, you have also, in, in one of the pages of your book, that um, you've actually captured another capture of the powerlessness narrative. Uh, it's by school children. You say the school children, deployment of school children in the climate debate. So here you have rich country school kids taking on the, the Greta Thunberg moment in, 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 in climate politics. Here you have these uh, largely well-to-do children now taking on the mantle of powerlessness and uh, urging the world for action and pretty much like Trump in some ways overwhelming the real marginalized populations in the global south. Now Trump is an easy fellow to hate. I, I get it. But uh, uh, how do you respond to the capture of this narrative by say the school children in the developed world? Yeah, and I mean that is, so on the one hand it's a very very smart use of that narrative by Greta Thunberg, right? And it's great that climate change has gotten onto the agenda, on, you know, on the global agenda, in a way that it just hasn't been before, right? And the fact that there is so much mobilization by school kids is amazing, right? But that there is, again, a twist in that tale, too. And we saw this with, um, for example, the marginalization of countries from the Global South. Mm -hmm. School children in the Global South were saying, why are these rich kids uh, telling us what to do about climate change. That's one example. The other, the other problem, and this is not a greater Thunberg problem, this is a problem on how the debate on climate change is being framed, right? And the problem is this, um, and it's one, of the, it's one of the findings of the book. Um, the temptation is for people to frame, you want to get attention of everybody, so you say this is a global problem. Macron tried to do this, right? He said, you know, Trump, it was, he, he didn't explicitly refer to Trump, that it was a reaction to Trump. Let's make America great again. No, let's make the planet great again. Let's do something for climate change, right? Now, the problem with that is, yeah, that's a great narrative, but he got the yellow vests, mm -hmm. right? And why does he get something like the yellow vest? Is because you can't be telling people in your, your own citizenry, um, think about the global problem of climate change when they are going to be losing jobs and will have severe wage cuts. And this is only in the global north. And then turn that around to a country like India, where 
per capita income is indeed much lower. And then to be lectured to on, oh, this is a global problem. You don't know what you're going to feed your kids today, so you probably aren't going to want to take a hit for a global problem for children globally, right? And so one of the points that I make on, about how do you build um, winning narratives is you need to have individual, local, emotional appeal. It's not going to be enough to just go, ah, oh, yeah, let's solve the world's problems. Okay, so let me now uh, uh, turn to our uh, discussions, and let me turn to Professor Pauli and, and Professor Godard. Um, let's look at the moment we are living in today. We are all, in some sense, victims of the pandemic. Various shades of victimhood, but certainly all have suffered. As we rebuild tomorrow, how do you foresee a narrative of working together emerge. What is the future of multilateralism when you have aggrieved citizenry all around? And in some sense, there is a nationalist impulse in every country. And in this mood, what is the narrative? And how do you navigate the narratives of exclusion, even as you require greater collaboration in the future? Professor Godard, may I turn to you first? I want to thank everybody um, for inviting me here and Amrita. This is, I read this book over the summer. I reached out to her to tell her how much I enjoyed this. Um, so it's really amazing uh, to be able to talk about this today. Um, to think about, to go to your question about collaboration during the pandemic, I think it goes to, to a broader question that I'd actually like to raise, which is that, you know, if you think about the story you're telling, Right. This is really about contest, not just about one narrative, but about contestation among narratives, mm -hmm. right? And so what we've really seen is an adoption of the narrative of powerlessness um, for uh, really nationalist purposes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so to go back to the question, like everybody's a victim now, and whether or not that was because of inequalities because of the trade regime and now inequalities because of the pandemic. And one thing I've been struggling with is how do you, or and, and can you create a narrative that allows the type of global mobilization, right, to affect this type of cooperation. And I'll tell you what concerns me <clears throat> is, is something in your book that talks about the necess necessity of having an emotive component, mm -hmm. right? How do you make something resonate um, when a lot of the arguments for global collaboration tend to fall back, I'm not saying all of them, on very technocratic language, right? Whereas the narratives for nationalist responses to things invoke all of this kind of rich cultural shared, shared language, right? So my concern um, it, it actually, you know, is, is twofold. You know, A, do you actually see in the wake of a pandemic not a move towards global collaboration, the type that we would want to see, particularly if we're going to make these types of responses to things like pandemics more robust, but at best we get kind of regional narratives, right? It's about working with partners. It's about working with clubs, and it becomes even more exclusionary. Right. Um, and I'm worried we're already seeing this right now in the vaccine responses. Right. We're, we're now seeing the idea that, you know, the, the global south actually did particularly African countries very well in, in the pandemic. But now we're moving towards the vaccine stage. Right. We're seeing a clearing of shells and, and a dumping of this in, 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 into the global north. So how much are we actually going to be able to construct some sort of uh, global narrative that's compelling and not exclusive of, of large swaths of the population? And, um, uh, you know, you mentioned the vaccines, um, and, and I'm going to come back to that in a bit. I want to talk about the narratives emerging around the vaccine in 2021. I'm going to make you look into the crystal ball and, and predict the geopolitics of the future, but, I, but that's an important aspect. Uh, now, Professor Pauli, uh, multilateralism in the future. Uh, we are entering the third decade. We are entering um, in a viral world. Uh, what is the narrative for collaboration or for uh, disengagement? Um, in the years ahead. So, Dr. Saran, thank you very much for this invitation. It's an honor to be uh, at the ORF, even if uh, just virtually. Uh, someday I hope to visit in person. I've been to India uh, quite a few times over the course of my career, and it's about time to get back there again. Uh, but let me just begin in response to your question by paying uh, tribute to uh, to. Uh, uh, Professor, Professor Narlikar is, um, you know, in, she is one of India's greatest exports. Mm -hmm. However, she's never really left India in her heart. 
And the really interesting thing to me is I've gotten to know her over the years and then read and reread this wonderful book very carefully. Her central message is it certainly resonates over time, not just in the trade arena and actually not just in the field of international relations. You know, the real image that, that uh, sticks with me, it's the Mahabharata. She is telling us that whatever happens in the world, uh, you have to tell the story. Mm -hmm. and whoever, whoever shapes the story wins the day. Now, we're all, three of us anyway, are political scientists, and uh, what we study is power. Let's just say, okay, power is always there. Power has many shapes, many many kinds and uh, and and uh, power is always in the background but i think the central message of the book and it's a response to your question dr saran uh, it's the power of the narrative itself yeah and 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 that power really gets onto the terrain of um, professor goddard it's about it's about the perennial human struggles over legitimation uh, mm -hmm. Taking the power that confronts us, that we use, that we're subject to, and and providing it with giving enough people who have enough um, uh, say in our own lives to consider that um, that power's use legitimate, yeah. And the narrative does that. So she tells us one story after another in a very highly technical arena of trade politics, right, which, you know, and, and the alphabet soup of, uh, of trade policy. That's very helpful, actually, for students of political economy who, are, who really are interested in trade. This is a good way into a very technical field and, and, a, and, a, and a wonderful orientation to contemporary history. But the more important message is, the, is that the, uh, is that whoever controls the narrative or shapes the most convincing narrative really wins the day in terms of, um, of, um, uh, of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me just give you an example of that in, in uh, res direct response to your, to your question. We're in a, in, partly this is telling the right story at the right moment in time. We're at a very fluid point. However, in, in, the, in the system as a whole, however you, however you want to characterize it, we're at a fluid point. And there is a great struggle going on on the narrative of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, one a narrative that is clearly emerging, that's very relevant for countries like India, is uh, the new multilateralism. Mm -hmm. The old multilateralism, especially as... Uh, as, uh, as featured in the, in the, at the core of the, the WTO, has reached a bit of a dead end. Yeah, we all, the world feels that, and it's looking for a new story, right? Now, this, if this, the story that we fear is the story told by authoritarians and nationalists. Yeah? Whoever, can tell the, whoever can tell the convincing story today about an, a relatively open world where collective action problems confronting us are, 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 are uh, managed collectively, uh, that storyteller will win the day. This is the wrong time to try to emulate Mr. Trump's story. I think that's a fair point. Otherwise, I want to I want to toss this back at you, but I'm going to twist it a little bit. Uh, we have a story emerging from the pandemic that if you are in a land uh, ruled by Emperor Xi Jinping, you are likely to be safe from the pandemic. You're likely to see order. You're likely to witness economic growth. You are likely to be able to uh, uh, assert and achieve your political objectives. And if you are in a land ruled by democratic um, uh, leaders. Uh, demagogues or otherwise, uh, you are likely to be on the street or on the hospital or uh, in shambles. Now, uh, you know, your book talks about not only storytelling, but your book also points to actions as being part of the story that emerge. So the, the, uh, what people see and experience is as important to the story that emerges 
as words that social scientists script. Now, what are the stories we are hearing today? And in your view, therefore, what is likely to be the texture of multilateralism in the next decade? Okay. Uh, all those are very uh, super interesting points. And I just want to say thank you so much uh, for the very kind words about the book. I very much appreciate that, you know, that you've taken such an interest and engaged with it, all of you. Um, and so these are really, these are tough questions. Let me try. Uh, and they all sort of do come together. Uh, so Samir, your point about uh, what, what does the texture of multilateralism in the future look like? And I think one of the most important points, one of the takeaways from the book really is that you, you, multilateralism lives in this happy technocratic bubble, right? You go to Geneva and you go to Brussels and there is nothing really wrong with multilateralism, right? Not really. People just don't understand how good, you know, we the IOs are for them. Right? And you see this also, and you see it very strongly in Germany, you know, which is a very, rightly so, a very committed Europeanist. It's a European power, right? And um, but we have a pandemic right now, and any talk of closing borders temporarily gets people into uh, into into this complete tizzy of annoyance and anger and 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 just outrage, right? And and then you get the comparisons, the ones that you were talking about, Samir. So those silly democracies don't know how to handle the pandemic. Authoritarians know how to do this. Now, in fact, it has to do with state capacity, probably, right? And we're seeing missing state capacity in both types. We're seeing this in authoritarian uh, states, and we're seeing this in democratic states. So that is actually not the false line. But the authoritarian states are using, are creating a far better narrative, and we're not creating we don't have a good narrative and sometimes we're not even able to uh, sustain the actions, right? Because we do in Germany, we're seeing a surge of cases. Uh, there's a big second wave that you're all reading about too, Germany, which had done reasonably well earlier. Maybe we can talk about this later on, on the different ways in which countries have dealt with the pandemic and the narratives. So the one, so one takeaway is you can't just create a good narrative living in a technocratic bubble. What you need to do is to be able to engage with people who are affected by whatever rules that you are trying to devise. In our case, we're talking about multilateralism, right? That's one. Um, and that means a good narrative has to be negotiated, right? Whoever you're negotiating with, it, and, and it's not just interstate. It means at the transnational level, it means at the, at the national level, the regional level, the local level. The second takeaway I would say is, I, you know, there is this sort of tendency for all of us to kind of go, you know, we want to preserve global cooperation, we want to preserve multilateralism. And I think we need to always ask the question, is it fit for purpose? And what is the purpose today? And in that sense, in the case of the WTO, I would argue it really isn't fit for purpose uh, because it was built for a post-World War II era where it was assumed that economic interdependence would lead to all good things, not only prosperity, but also peace. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing something quite different, right? And it's not just, I mean, that's what our colleagues Henry Farrell and Abe Newman argue, and I buy the argument. Uh, and the argument is that uh, this is not just old-fashioned economic statecraft. We have such well-integrated global value chains, and these are not just diffuse networks. State power sits on these networks. And because that is the case, it means that we need to update the rules, because the rules so far have assumed that you can have freely functioning markets with very little state intervention. And just how broken the organization that I study uh, most deeply is an example, even the transparency function is not working, right? Because the WTO in its trade monitoring reports cannot talk about subsidies, which is ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not only China, it's also other countries. And, and so multilateralism needs a new purpose, which needs to be defined, right? And, and that brings me to the third point about we need to be able to accept that there are some problems that are real that the old multilateralism didn't solve, and maybe the new multilateralism will not look, it will not be a replica of the old one, 
which is not what people in Geneva and Brussels want to hear, right? And um, and and it may look like. And so Stacy talked about, you know, is it regional? Is it clubs? And it's I I think we are it. it that that could be one model where you're where we might get deeper levels of integration. What Samir has called gated globalization. You have deeper integration within like within amongst like-minded allies, right? And you still have cooperation on certain other areas, which is global, right? So you see, um, and if you don't recognize the problems, what I worry about is we'll just get fragmentation, like complete fragmentation. None of this. Uh, you know the, this uh, concentric circles model, or um, a very uh, or variable geometry model. We just get fragmentation, right? And that is going to be deeply unhelpful. And just one last point, I, if I may, on how do we, you know, how do we try and build a good narrative on multilateralism, a convincing narrative on multilateralism? The problem has been that. And we, even now, when and I'm I'm worried whether this is we're going to revert to that because during the Trump era, we have seen Canada, for example, uh, work together with other countries um, like Germany and say, yeah, we need to look at like-minded allies. France is a part of this initiative. The Alliance for Multilateralism is an example of this initiative, right? But now the hope is that Biden comes in and everything goes back to normal. Right? I don't think it's going to go, trade is not going to go back to the way it was because of the problems of weaponized interdependence amongst other things. Right? And so um, the narrative building might go back to the old type, which is, oh, we're the liberal countries, and that is Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, Germany. Right? But that is not how you construct an inclusive winning narrative. What you need to do is to be able to say, there are varieties of liberalism, right? And I see, and Lou, Lou has spotted it right, I, my heart has never really left India, and I see a strong tradition of liberalism in India. Again, there are different narratives in India, but a strong one is of liberalism and pluralism, right? There are other countries which are not Western, and they have liberalism, but if we don't do this kind of narrative construction, we, we will have is a tiny little club of, lib of Western democracies, and that will not help solve. It will not help rebuild multilateralism. So Amrita, that's a good point for me to uh, come back to Stacey with the vaccine question, and I'm going to put it more bluntly. Uh, you've seen reports coming out that the rich countries have stocked up, stock, created stockpiles of vaccine, or, you know, through ordering or booking or cannibalizing uh, production. Uh, Canada has possibly uh, the largest stockpile per capita. I think they have 10 vaccines for every person. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, uh, Canada too believes in reincarnation. They're probably protecting someone over many lifetimes. But um, let me, let me uh, when you have this lived narrative emerging of uh, rich countries um, crowding out uh, access to lifeline, from other country, for, for other countries. How do you ask them to partner with you in the development challenges, and the climate challenges, and technology challenges? How can you do this and with a straight face create a global partnership of democracies for AI or strive for a, demo, a coalition of democracies on other fields? How do you do this with a straight face? How can you tell the two different stories with a, with, you know, through the same source? Um, you know, I, I, I feel like I should let Professor Polly answer the Canadian question, but that being said, I mean, so Canada is actually obviously trying to do it both ways, right, because they're both saying we stockpiled because we are a responsible uh, country is going to take care of its citizens, but anything we don't use, we are going to give away. Right, so they're actually telling a narrative both of yes, we're trying to protect our, our, our political community, but we're also doing this. And I think we should all. I mean, yes, I, I see skeptical faces and, and, and that I tend to, but that's certainly what Canada's trying to do. You know, it's interesting. I was typing down a lot of thoughts as everybody was talking. I actually see some parallels um, in different narratives between the pandemic and global cooperation around things like climate change. And that is to say, you know, on, on the one hand, we have um, China and, and other countries that have been talking about a narrative of a better mode of leadership and obviously many times rooted in authoritarianism uh, and, and the ability to control, right, um, the ability to, 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 to mitigate. One of my inter yeah, one of the things I, I think might be interesting about that is the extent to which we begin to see a, a narrative of we managed to adapt. 
right? Mm -hmm. That that in some ways the power of of of, 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 of these democracies, the power of these 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 Western nations, was that well, we went through a crisis and it was messy, but look how we innovated our way out of this, right? So almost the sense of like constant adjustment, um, and 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 scientific innovation. The problem with that is that is an extraordinarily dangerous and exclusionary narrative, right? Because we know to move over to issues like climate change, um, that adaptation of that scale is very much a wealthy nation's strategy, mm -hmm. right? It is the ability to throw an amazing amount of money um, and waste an amazing amount of money um, mm -hmm. at a particular problem in ho hopes that something, that you'll be able to basically miracle your way through this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so my concern then is that with, with, without any form of form of global cooperation mechanism, right, that these different problems, these ultimately transboundary problems, whether or not they're pandemics or climate change, begins to reinforce these types of club responses that, Amrita, I think you're rightly saying they're exclusionary, they're not productive, and they work against having some sort of global multilateralism, right? And to be clear, I don't, I, I'm not saying that then the, the ideal response would be kind of the WTO mm -hmm. IMF. Right. Um, I feel like to, to kind of echo some of your points, I'm that the, these organizations spent way too long denying pluralism and actually in many ways denying politics. Mm -hmm. Right. It became mm -hmm. very technocratic, very there is one common good and we're all in pursuit of it. And there are no differences and nobody can quarrel. Right. But there has to be some sort of narrative that creates something that's not just, once again, a global north, global south divide mm -hmm. or some sort of West versus China divide. And my concern is these types of challenges and the way we're mobilizing around them are beginning to build those types of boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Professor Pauli, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to uh, uh, explain Canada, but I have a few questions for you that have come in from the audience. In fact, now I want to uh, turn the direction of this conversation and focus on the audience that has been um, asking uh, 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 lots of questions from all of you. And I'm, I want to try and bring four or five of them into this, uh, uh, into the evening. Uh, Professor Pauli. Well, uh, you know, hypo hypocrisy is nothing new in, in human affairs, right? So one of, the, uh, one of my colleagues explains that, look, Canadians are no different than, uh, than anybody else, right? So my colleague asks the question, why did the Canadian cross the road? Well, the answer clearly is to get to the middle. <laughs> no, that's no different than, I mean, that's just human, it's human beings, right, in, in society. So when we're... To, trying to come to grips with the with the pandemic, the sharing of vaccines, et cetera, um, and and what what I guess the overarching theme these days is right, right for 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 uh, for Amrita's uh, audience, rising powers and the new multilateralism. Now, when you, when you really get right down to it, it really does come come uh, to the the key point I think she just made. That is, we negotiate over narratives yeah we're telling a story we are telling a story we are telling stories together and trying to shape the dominant narrative the narrative that will shape the future yeah and and there's a contest over that and that's the deepest contest it is a it is a legitimation contest so one way that that i'm thinking about this now and i think uh it resonates with uh Amrita's book, but for rich countries and for the powerful interests within them, uh, the narrative of the new multilateralism entails coming to grips with the, the real sharing of sovereign prerogatives, which is something that, for instance, has never been attempted in the United States. Yeah, this is new. This is new. When, when uh, the post-war trading system was constructed. The American economy was something like, I don't know, 60% of the global economy. It's now one-seventh. That is a fact. Yeah, that is a, that is a power fact. And therefore, any movement forward is going to take a new narrative. Yeah, and for the rich countries, it really does seriously mean coming to grips with the sharing of sovereignty. Now, that's a big swallow, actually, when you get right down to it. It's nothing new for Canadians, but it's a big swallow for great powers. Now, in the, in one of, certainly the, the, the British Prime Minister is, uh, has put forward a proposal that it's, it's beyond the small, uh, 
well, it, but but it's not. It's it's a it's a big step certainly for for uh, the G7 to go to a G10, which includes, according to his proposal, South Korea, Australia, and India. Yeah. Now that's a very significant moment in an emerging narrative, which is either going to be grasped by India or rejected. Now, at the same time, with clear eyes and realizing that we are trying to construct a narrative here, there is a potential trap mm -hmm. for countries like India, mm -hmm. because that would then, in the in the in the context of a of a of a still club-like setting at the core of the system, uh, could mean that India is signing up for responsibilities at, or is potentially helping to legitimate policies that may, in the long run, may not be very good for it or other rising powers. Yeah. So to come back to Amrita's point, it is about the fundamental negotiation of the, of the narrative. Great. Uh, so to, 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 to put it in, in, in very specific terms, a place at the table is one thing. But if it means then, for example, legitimating border adjustment measures, mm -hmm. That mean that somebody else has to somebody else will adjudicate your your environmental policy um, uh, performance. You have to be clear-eyed about that and say, wait a minute, that's not the narrative that we thought we were getting involved in. Uh, this is uh, uh, so so to know to know upfront what it is we're actually negotiating about is uh, uh, is the key and the big picture that that Amrita is, is pointing us to toward is is actually the key uh, excellent so, uh, may I just come in on the vaccine question quickly yeah, uh, i want to say i want i and i i'm, I'm, I'm going to say something which is maybe slightly controversial and it is this i i think it's really important for all countries including canada to be able to say we are looking after our citizens, right? Because this is why multi but this is one of the reasons why multilateralism has been failing. It's been helping countries and their people, right? But because there's this whole globalist narrative, which is somehow pitted as against the nationalist one, right? That that's a mistake. And in, and by buying that story, we kind of play to the hands of the populist, the populist nationalist. But Amrita, why do you want ten vaccines per person? No, 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 wait. So let me just answer the question because I raised this question yesterday, right, on Twitter, and I asked uh, Roland Paris, amongst other people, on what was going on. And what they said was uh, that the uh, Canada had hedged its bets because it didn't know which vaccine was going to be successful. And they were going, and there was a debate on how they would give away, sell at the at the price that they had bought the vaccine or whatever. There was a debate underway on the ones they didn't need, right? Even there, I would ask, I would say the government should go one step further and not just vaccinate the entire population, which is what the debate looks like right now, but according to needs, mm -hmm. right? And so it you, you need a certain percentage to be vaccinated. Yes, it's 70 percent, but the most vulnerable groups, et cetera, et cetera, right? And the reason why Canada should do this and developed country, other developed countries should do this um, is because if they don't, we do have China, and China is running around saying, well, here, we'll give you the vaccine for free, right? And so if you, that will sort of, it sort of plays to the point that you had raised earlier, Samir, on um, the, the authoritarian narrative, right? And, and so it's in the interest of domestic populations to do, if countries like Canada do pay attention to domestic need, but they also pay attention to the needs of allies, right? Allies and friends, like-minded countries who can still, the winning of hearts and minds will also include vaccine diplomacy. China's doing it and the West isn't. Okay, so I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions. Uh, uh, and then I'm going to come back to uh, both our discussions again, because there are some directed at you, uh, Amrita. First question, uh, is the co-opting of the poverty narratives by countries like the U.S. likely to diminish in the new Biden presidency? And I know your book has actually compared Obama and Trump on, on, on some aspects. I, I've, as I was glancing through your book, I saw that. Uh, what is your quick take? Biden, and is he going to push the poverty narrative or 
are we going to see? Uh, I, I, I think Biden is going to push the poverty narrative um, for, dom uh, for domestic reasons within the U.S. Not much is going to change on that front, but he's also going to try and be a multilateralist at the same time. So there will be so, a difference, but poverty narrative usage is not going to go away. And we have seen over time successive administrations have deployed it. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then, then this was a question by Ria Kasliwal. I am now posing a question by Nishta Sain. Does the book suggest that developing and poor, poor countries are at an advantage when it comes to international negotiations? And are these countries more likely to get a favorable outcome? And yes, uh, they were at um, through around the turn of the millennium to about 2000 and about a decade. Uh, they were. They were exploiting this very well. They were harnessing this power. But then, as I argue in the book, they, some of these countries overused this weapon themselves. right? And that was one of the reasons why we got the repeated deadlocks in the Doha negotiations. There are many reasons for the Doha deadlocks. You can't have like a, that, a, a set of deadlocks that lasted for over, well over a decade caused by one reason. Right? But one of the reasons was indeed the overuse of the poverty narrative by developing countries and then the misuse of it. So now this is not such a great weapon because it's like, like Stacey put it very nicely, like everybody's a victim, everybody's powerless, everybody's poor. And in this context, it's the developing countries who will take the biggest hit. Great. Uh, and uh, the third question, which is perhaps uh, just to you, and then we will pose the other two to all three of you. Uh, a question from Vertika Tripathi. Can rising inequality, like in the case of pandemic and other similar situations, be explained through narrative economics in addition to just slow growth or varied growth after a recession? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And I would say narrative economics plays a very important role because that is what determines the policies that determine the kind of growth you will get. Right, so the narrative economics part predates, uh, I mean, precedes, precedes how, what policies that you're putting into place for growth, for debt relief, for protection of life versus livelihood versus lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? And so narrative economics is key to this and not enough people are paying attention. They're kind of making it all about, oh, yo, if we have enough, uh, you know, we'll make use of public debt and then we'll be sorted, right? But there is a prior point on how do you justify it. The point about legitimation that Lou raised is also very important, but it's, but it's also the prior question. How are you framing the macroeconomic problems? And that's why narrative economics is key in this time of a pandemic. Okay, so now I'm going to ask a couple of questions to all three of you. And, and uh, Stacey, let me ask you this question. Uh, would you find the new wave of self-protectionist economies to be concerning? especially in the type of narratives that they will create in the context of international independence as a reason for peace. We heard about interdependence as being a stabilizer, as the peacemaker. Is exclusionary economics changing that narrative? So uh, my question to you is, was interdependence ever the peacemaker or was it just a narrative? Uh, like we have fictional narratives, was it fiction rather than real? And two, are exclusionary economics going to create political turbulences? Okay. Um, you know, on the, on the question of whether or not interdependence was a peacemaker, right? Um, I feel like there's this tendency that we, even as, as academics, we have a hard time dealing with the idea that it is both. Right, that you can have contradictory dynamics in the same phenomenon, right? So yes, on the one hand, of course, in many ways, it's a peacemaker, right? We can talk about the ways in which interdependence, for example, makes things like territorial conquest in some situations unnecessary, right? That you don't need to actually engage in the type of same conquest and extractive policies that you, for example, saw in formal imperialism, leading inside a, a, a informal, right? Right? But at the same time, and you know, I, I will also reference um, Henry Farrell and, and Abe Newman's work well, it was as almost though as the field and, and policymakers steered towards this idea, right? They decided to neglect the ways in which that type of interdependence also creates power positions and vulnerabilities, right? That actors 
and I agree with Lou here, all actors are alike, they will actually see the vulnerabilities and try to exploit it for power political competition, right? So I, I hope that's not unsatisfactory because it's not one answer, right? But in some ways we have to deal with the tensions between them, right? Mm -hmm. That in some ways it makes absolute sense to have, for example, an interdependent world as we're dealing with 5G technology and AI, right? There's no reason to engage in nationalist, exclusive power political competition, but we need to be aware of the ways in which that also creates vulnerabilities, right? Mm -hmm. So to go to the question of whether, you know, what this actually means for the future, I mean, I'm in the camp that, that devolving into completely exclusionary mercantilist politics is downright silly, unproductive. It will do nothing but increase power political competition and make everybody poor and less happy, right? But that doesn't mean that you continue to build institutions that don't recognize the type of vulnerabilities. And here, I won't go into details because we're running short on time. This is where I really love to have a conversation around this concerning things like 5G technologies, right? Mm -hmm. To pretend that this is just a happy, you know, world of cooperation will actually create significant um, downfalls in power politics. But it doesn't mean you just become a self-sufficient nationalist. I'm, uh, this was by Varnika Mehta. I want to acknowledge her question. Uh, uh, Louis, let's, uh, Louis, let me flip this question a little bit and ask you to again look into the future. Do you believe that the narratives around trade, around economic interdependence, around supply chain vulnerabilities, about distrust in uh, generally uh, the traditional uh, trading system is it going to take us to a political flashpoint? Or is the narrative of contest beginning to get stronger wind than the narrative of peace and prosperity? So, uh, look, the way, I, the way I'm thinking about this now is, uh, is in very practical terms. And to, to go along um, Stacy's line in response and then to come back to the pandemic issue. Look, we all want to have our cake and, and we want to eat it too. We all do, right? Now, it, it's very helpful if we, if we um, tell a, if we agree on the big story, but then take little aspects of the story and apply those aspects to particular problems. Now, there are certain problems that cannot be solved unless we solve them, unless we address them together. Uh, if the rich countries um, vaccinate every rich person in the world, but poor countries are left out, we don't come to grips with COVID-19. The, the virus mutates and it comes back straight into the rich countries. You don't have to be an epidemiologist to see that it's happening even right in front of our eyes. All you have to do is read the newspaper. So we cannot, and, and this, is, this is not just common sense, it fits with the global narrative. You know? At the same time, it's quite true that we have local needs. And if our, if our leaders do not satisfy those local needs, we will get rid of them, whether we're democracies or not. Yeah? So there's an essential point here that goes to the core story of the countries that are around the table right now, India, the United States, and Canada. They're federations. We don't agree on very much internally in our own countries but we do agree that there are certain problems that we need to address together or we don't solve them for ourselves but there are many problems we can leave out of that yeah this is the core of the issue we are facing now globally the pandemic brings it to the fore ai brings it to the fore it, climate change brings it to the fore and it, that's the story we're beginning to tell ourselves now, we as political scientists need to trace out for our students, not least, what this actually means in practical terms and what the new trade-offs will have to be. In my, as a Canadian, uh, I have no problem with the core meaning here. It is sovereignty is not black and white. Yeah? My identity is not one or the other. Yeah? These, this, the big story we are negotiating together in the telling right now. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, Amrita, now I'm coming to the last two questions, one by Tanushri Chandra, and she wants to know how do we build a winning narrative for climate action in a country such as India? 
uh, and uh, Martin Mishra, uh, who asks you that uh, India is going through tough times. Uh, you know, we saw the debate around our set. We stayed out. We have geopolitical questions. We have certain uh, systemic challenges to address before we can embrace uh, the FTAs with many countries. Uh, and we have issues around labor and, and informal employment. Uh, for a country like India, how do we build? I'm, I'm going to give you three minutes to build two narratives, one around climate change uh, and mobilizing people in the country, and second around uh, India's trade approach and trade policy uh, while looking at our specific situation of low per capita income and informal employment in the labor class. Um, okay. So um, I, I my cop-out answer would be, I told you a good narrative has to be negotiated. So my answer doesn't really matter. But I want to answer those core questions. Um, so I will, I, I, so climate change. Uh, and this is a direction, whatever you think of Modi and his various policies, yes, one thing that in, in, in my eyes I think he did correctly is he is the way he started framing the mitigation and adaptation agenda. Right? And what he did was he referred to traditional Indian texts. Right? He quoted from the Atharva Veda, for example, and said, you, the Global North, don't need to come and teach us about climate change. Protecting nature comes naturally to Indians. Right? I thought that was a very smart move because suddenly he, he started making that discussion homegrown. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not talking about policies. I'm just talking about the narrative here. Mm -hmm. right? The other important way in which and you get a climate change narrative in any country to work is to show that it really works for people who are alive now, mm -hmm. right? And not few That's just future generations. generations. Yeah. Right? And, and my own personal private take on this is I think the entire debate on climate change is extremely anthropocentric. It bothers me. Right? And so, and this whole assumption that we own the planet and we protect the planet for future generations of humans, no, then it's what, what we have done to biodiversity is terrible, right? So that if I were building that narrative, I would have a big biodiversity animal ethics agenda in there. Trade, reset India stayed out, got a lot of bad press for it. In my eyes, it was the smart thing to do, right? There, there, to me, this is very clear. Right? Just because everybody, and I mean, Aust and a lot of countries are hedging their bets, like Australia on the one hand, picking huge fights with China on the other, and getting punished for it. On the other hand, goes and joins RCEP, right, is a part of the quad. I think it was smart of India not to join RCEP, but this is not a sustainable situation if everybody else bandwagons onto RCEP. Mm -hmm. And so what we need is good alternatives for India, good batmas. Mm -hmm. And this is where the U.S., could play a bigger role. The EU should play a bigger role. Canada could play a bigger role. And just one last point on trade. Every time I talk about values, everybody in the in the in in Europe tends to fixate on labor standards, right? And we know how that discussion goes in India, right? But now we have very serious macro level values under challenge: democracy, liberalism, pluralism, right? And if we get an alliance or partnership, don't call it an alliance, call it a partnership of the like-minded, then those goods will follow, those, those public goods will follow on labor standard protection. But if we fixate on labor standards and forget about the values we share with India in the West, then this is bad for the West, it's bad for India. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take two minutes more than I had promised uh, to all of you. I promised you a one-hour conversation. I'm going to go over by two to three minutes because I have to ask you this question. It's part of your book. It's part of your next book because you haven't fully explored it. Uh, you have mentioned it, that narratives need to be local. Uh, they have to relate to uh, something real. And my question to all three of you is that we have seen in democracies you have two set of narratives, local narratives to win local elections, to win democratic elections, and you have international narratives to negotiate winning deals. And sometimes they are in conflict. What do you do when narratives required to win democracies are not likely to gain you much traction in international negotiations? What happens when they collide? And we are at that particular moment that all our governments in plural societies have to respond to the locality and yet talk about multilateralism in a global order. We have to do it together. And my question to you is, can that happen? 
and does that happen? I mean, I know it does, and I, 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 I want to work with Amrita on the next book, but how do you see this happening at this moment? It has happened in the past, but how do you see this evolving in the next? So I'll start with Professor Polly. I will go to Stacy, and then I will come back to Professor Narlikar for the final words. And I'll give you one minute each. Professor Polly. <clears throat> so this is the essential political leadership question. So I would just turn it back and ask, uh, ask your audience to think empirically. And then we draw out some stories from those uh, empirical examples. Uh, have we, have, since this is the perennial problem, especially in a large country with many interests and many uh, uh, diverse peoples, uh, have we seen in the past times when successful leaders have been able to negotiate, the st tell the story, tell a, tell a reasonably consistent story at two different levels? My answer is yes, we could go, we, we're going to have a, a much longer discussion about this, but the most successful leaders have been able to do exactly, Dr. Saran, what you just pointed to. So the leader right now Mr. Biden is taking inspiration from is Franklin Roosevelt in the, in the, both in, in the pre-war period and the post-war period. This master storyteller around the fireside did exactly what you just explained that we needed to do now. Is it easy? No. And right now we're seeing leaders across the world who are failing to seize the moment, to seize the day. You've just articulated the, the challenge of the, of the day. Stacey. Yeah. Um, if I had a complete answer to this, um, I'd be a lot more powerful th th than what I am. But, but to actually build on this point, it is about, to me, you have to recognize sovereign political communities. You have to recognize that, that, that ultimately we are not simply in a system where all of us have the same interests and all have the same vision, but we do have these political communities, but to be able to tell a story about how the fate of our communities are interlinked. Right. So it's not simply about all of us just generating consensus and going along, but it is about the need for each of us to be able to survive, to sign some sort of some sort of pathway to work together. Right. And again, that that's the challenge. There is no one answer to that. It's going to be constant contestation. Right. But hopefully contestation that's not about um, that is productive. That's not simply about zero sum politics. Professor Narlikar, uh, sorry, Paul, you want to just, come? Just, just a tiny, just a tiny footnote here. To to to, uh, I think uh, the, since this is the que since this this is the question of the moment. Uh, in a great new book that uh, we're all reading, John Eikenberry's "A World Safe for Democracy." He goes back to one of Roosevelt's key fireside chats at the, one of the critical moments, and explains what the vision for the future is. And he uses the evocative phrase. Roosevelt did, family of nations. We all have our nations. We all have our national interests. But at a certain point, we have to live as one family. Now, in a very simple folksy way, that story, that narrative Roosevelt told resonated and was politically effective at that moment. That's what we're searching for right now. And if somebody can think of a better phrase than family of nations, I have yet to hear it. Amrita, a Roosevelt in the digital age, where Twitter is going to tear everything you say down. Is it possible to build that kind of a master story? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I know it shouldn't be called the family of nations, anymore uh, with all that we have seen happening in the global south and also under weaponized interdependence i don't have uh, i don't have like a three word tweetable uh, phrase yet lou uh, but i will say that i actually think the problem is um we have made it harder for ourselves it's we have allowed it to become a very difficult problem in this era of polarization because I really agree with what Stacey said. You have to recognize sovereign political communities. And because we live in this world of polarization, we get the either or, right? We get 
oh, you're for the EU or you're against the EU. If you want to have temporary restrictions on the free movement of people, you're clearly against the EU. And no, no, I want to protect my people and also the European Union because the European Union is constituted by my people, should be the answer, right? And so, um, and the problem, of course, is the middle path is never exciting, it's never tweetable, it's never sexy enough, right? Whereas to go, oh, you're for against something and against something is much easier. Right? So I think that is the problem, the polarization is the problem. But in fact, I don't see necessarily a contradiction between the meeting the de internal domestic demands and achieving something mean meaningful at the global, international, some form of multilateral level. Excellent. So I, I think I have um, already made you stay back for five minutes over the agreed time limit. And I want to really thank Professor Narlikar first for putting this together. I think uh, it is a very important piece of literature. And uh, all of those who are interested in trade negotiation, why have they attained certain degree of success and why are they stuck in a certain space should read this book. And it has the answers. Um, I'm very grateful that both uh, Professor Godard and Professor Pauli could join us and uh, share some insights on uh, very important questions that we all have to respond to in the days ahead. And uh, I want to use this opportunity to wish the panelists and all of our audience a uh, happy holidays and a very happy new year. Uh, I hope that this is my last event this year and I am only going to meet you early next year. But if I don't, if I change my mind and I come back, I will wish you again, but till then, take care, stay safe, mask up, and uh, uh, enjoy family, enjoy the world, and enjoy the communities we live in. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. That was wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much.